Welcome to our INPEX Sustainability School. My name is Carlotta Wiege and I'm part of the INPEX Sustainability uh, Management Team. And uh, for those of you who are maybe joining us for the first time just now, um, we created the Sustainability School to educate and initiate action towards more sustainability. Uh, as a global network, uh, we would like to follow the path to sustainability together with our customers, suppliers, and our uh, consumers. Um, as part of this effort, today we have Antoine Rigaud from Diversity here with us. Um, he is the Executive Director of Sustainable Development, and he's going to talk about the topic, uh, the carbon footprint of cleaning products, the definition, importance, and pitfalls to consider. So I hope you can hear me. Um, I can't hear you. <laughs> so it makes a very interesting situation. My name is Antoine Rocco. Um, I'm working with Diversi and I'm responsible for sustainable development in a company for Europe. Uh, Diversi is a supplier of cleaning and hygiene solutions, a leading supplier to customers in food and beverage, hospitality, food service, building maintenance and the healthcare sectors. Um, and we do that worldwide. And I, that was the first one. I want to um, share some introduction with you on global warming, warming, the importance of global warming and the relevance of aspects like carbon footprinting and life cycle assessments. Very much buzzwords at the moment in the industry, but it's very important to understand what do they mean what's in it and what are the pitfalls when you talk about these sort of things. And that's what I want to share with you by using some practical examples. And I'll leave you at the end of the talk with some key takeaways that I hope you can apply when you go back on Monday into your operations. So that's what I want to achieve. So I will start with a small introduction about global warming, how important that is to us and explain you a little bit about what is carbon footprinting and what is LCA, life cycle assessments. Everybody will have heard about greenhouse gases. Well, what is a greenhouse gas? Greenhouse gas are some gases that are emitted from the earth into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is like a cover around earth. And that's very useful because without that cover around earth, things will go very cold. All the warmth and radiation will go out into space and we will just be a clump of ice floating around in space. We need that atmosphere around the Earth. But what we are doing is we are emitting a lot of gases into that atmosphere that reflect the warmth of the Earth. Like in the greenhouse, we have a roof around the Earth. And that by putting more of these gases into the atmosphere, the Earth warms up and that is what we call the global warming it's like a greenhouse we put too much cover around the earth and there is not one green gas it's not carbon dioxide is everything there are other gases as well all together we call them the greenhouse gases already in 2014 scientific evidence came up that we are polluting this atmosphere with all these greenhouse gases by our industries and our use as humans. And that causes the warming up of Earth. Shockingly, in the last 30 years, we've created more greenhouse gas emissions than all the 200 years before. And the 200 years is since the Industrial Revolution. Imagine the million years before. The last 20 years, we have put in the Earth atmosphere 40% more per year than ever before. And that is what is why it is so worrying, this global warming issue. And the European Union have decided to do something about it, and that's called the Green Deal. And in the Green Deal, the objective is Europe as a continent needs to become natural, zero emissions neutrality, no climate change out of Europe. Look at these numbers and you say, what is the challenge? 
it is very, very big to achieve that. Let's be very clear about that. By the way, it's only a hundred <laughs> companies that are using fossil fuels that cost that 40%. And these fossil fuel companies are state owned. That is shocking to realize. So a lot of talk about carbon footprint. What does it mean? The carbon in the word carbon footprint stands for all the greenhouse gases. Because it's too much words, we say carbon. The footprint is a total impact we have on the global warming point of view. And that's shown by showing a footprint. The way we measure it, the metric unit, is CO2 equivalent. Just imagine the meter is the metric for a length. CO2 equivalent is the measure for global warming impact. Simple as that. It's the amount of equivalent CO2 that we put in the atmosphere. But you have to remember, like when you say, what's the surface of a rectangular, and you only talk about the length, you don't know what the surface is. The same in carbon footprint. You need to know what's included in your definition. It's not just the length, it's also the width of your rectangular. And here in carbon footprinting, you need to agree what the definitions are and what's included and what's not included. Because otherwise it's not a footprint, it's a toe print. And you're faking your impact. Give you another example. If you drive a car from home to work, you can measure the amount of carbon emission and the global impact you will have by doing so. But in reality, it's not just that short driving distance from home to work. It's also every other time you use the car. It's also including the producing and the making of your car. It is also the use of the fuel that go into your car. It is the company that makes the fuel. If you start thinking about that, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so remember what's included in your definition. And the second one is what's your scope? And again, take the car example. If your scope is just my car and the drive from home to work, we call that scope one. It's very limited. But if you take also the amount of fuel that goes in and the making of that fuel and the use of that, then it's scope two. If you also include somebody who produced the car for me and sells it to me, and you want to know how much carbon footprint is involved in that, we call that scope three. Scope three is what you yourself will not control. It's outside of your control. It is in the control of somebody else, but you need to include it in your assessment to make it a fair assessment. And that makes it very difficult because if you are a cleaning company, yeah, you clean an area and you believe my global footprint is my cars, the guys that are doing the cleaning, the use of the brushes and all these sort of things. But somebody is providing you with the cleaning products as well. You are not in control. So what does a cleaning company do? What does Impact do? They come to us and say, tell me what's your global footprint for your products because I need to know for my scope three <laughs> assessments. But when you start thinking about that, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And that makes it so complicated. In order to do that, we have something that's called life cycle assessment. The life cycle assessment is looking at carbon footprint, global warming potential of the whole cycle of your product. It is not only glo global warming, it also includes any other aspects of environmental impact. This can be aquatic toxicity. It can be the impact on the ecology. It can be what's the harm to the animals. It can be very big. That is called life cycle assessment. And there are different methods of doing that. And I will not explain to you how that works. I only want you to leave you with the last, at the end, two messages. One, don't forget, global environmental impact is not just global warning. It's a lot of other things. Secondly, there is a new development going on in the European Union, and that's called product environmental footprinting. They are creating a new standard and a new method 
for doing life cycle assessments. That's interesting because what they tried to do is to make it a standard in the market. And that is, I guess, a big need because everybody is using a slightly different way. So it's good if we get some sort of standard for Europe at least. I make it even more complicated. Take my car example again. Are you thinking about your car as something that I bought and I'm using and then the car is broken, fine, away with it. If you do that assessment over that time period, we call that cradle to grave. The car dies and that's it. If you want to take into account as well, what happens to the car after it breaks down and it's dismantled and the metals is re reused, etc. You're looking at a cradle to cradle process from start till end. There are different cycles to look at. And the only thing I want you to remember is these different words. Again, if your company wants to do LCA and carbon footprinting, you need to tell us, if you want our help, which of those processes you want to look at. From the start, from the factory to the gate, or from when you get the product to using the product. All these different makes a difference on your total life cycle assessment. So what I've tried to explain to you, this is science. This is not something you do on the back of an envelope or on a little beer carton. Yeah, it is science and it's complicated and it requires expertise. It requires a lot of technical data. They're not easily available, but luckily there are a lot of consultants out in the market who make a business out of this. Yeah, they have huge databases that we can exploit, we can use, we can benefit on. But if you want to do an LCA study, think in weeks or even months to do the work. Yeah, it takes a lot of time and effort to do a full LCA. But there is tools, there are software you can use for this. So after all this theory, let's go to some practical examples. And I have three questions that I will use. The first one is, are super concentrated cleaning products better than ready to use cleaning? And we all intuitively will say probably yes, because the product is more concentrated, we'll use less plastic, we'll use less packaging, less transport. Does that show up in the global warming potential of these products? And the answer is yes. However, here is the first thing to watch out for, because there are two ways you can look at this. Are you looking at the case of product that I'm buying from, for example, Diversi? If these are concentrated products in one case, six in a bottle, versus a case of ready to use products, then the ready to use products will come out better. Why? There is less chemistry in it. So, the impact from the chemistry is much less in the case of ready to use product than in concentrate. However, if you think about how much can I clean with a box of concentrate versus ready to use, then the concentrate, you can clean much more surface. So if you measure it by amount of surface or the efficiency of cleaning, the result on the left hand side flips. And your global warning potential is much, much better with super concentrate than they are with ready to use products, just as you would intuitively feel. But remember, if you do a scope three analysis as a company, you don't know how much area you will be cleaning. So you will ask your suppliers, give me your global warning scope three level by case. Well, we can do that, but you get a totally wrong conclusion at the end. So, Always think when you do and ask for global warming potential and carbon footprint measures and LCAs, do that by effective cleaning and not by case, please. Second example, are eco-certified products and natural products any better than standard products? Well, remember, eco-certification is nothing more than a stamp by somebody to say you are green but the product they stamp might be exactly the same as your standard product. There are some criteria, but if your product and your formulation is similar, the stamp doesn't matter. And you can see that 
when I show you this, this next slide, that the difference between the standard product and the eco-certified product is minimal. If you move your petrochemical ingredients to natural ingredients, yes, you will get a difference because the natural products and the renewable ingredients have a lower carbon footprint than normal petrochemical ingredients. However, I will explain again a little pitfall. What you see on this slide, the blue is a ready to use product. The two green ones is a standard product, concentrate, and an eco-certified product with the same application. The difference is marginal because it's only the stamp. But when you move to the natural products, you will see, and those are the purple bars, you will see an improvement. It goes down with 60%. So it is useful to move to natural products, renewable ingredients. However, a warning. Imagine you make a product from sugar cane. And the example can be, you want to have alcohol fuels to drive your cars. This is the case in Brazil. They drive on alcohol, not, not fuel, not benzene. They use alcohol in the cars. But for making the alcohol, they use huge sugar cane plantations. Yeah, they use them by turning down the Amazon because they need plantations. And they're not using these plantations to create food for the people. They're using them to get the alcohol to drive their cars. You can imagine that doesn't make sense. Yeah. However, if you use the waste coming from the sugar canes, like the leaves that are thrown away, etc., etc., and you use that to create your raw materials, you're not wasting the land and you're not competing with the food production. In that case, there is a major benefit in global warming potential. And that you can see here, petrochemical ingredients on the left, natural ingredients in the middle, but they use crops to grow these specific ingredients. And on the right hand side, when you don't take the crops, but you take the waste from the agricultural crops, then the global warming is significantly better. Yeah, so it makes sense to go to natural base ingredients and products and formulations. But you need to ask your supplier, where do they come from? My last question, does it make sense to go to PCR plastics? PCR is post-customer reused plastic. So you bring your PET bottle to the recycler and he makes a new bottle and that plastic is being reused. That's called PCR plastics. Does it make sense that we all invest in PCR plastics? Well, yes and no. Of course it makes sense because you reuse the plastic. So the amount of waste in the environment, in the oceans will go down. Absolutely. That's the key reason why we should be doing this. But does it have a benefit on global warming as well? It depends. If you put PCR in your packaging, the global warming potential of that packaging goes down. So yes, there is an improvement. And the improvement is more significant the bigger the packaging is. Makes sense. However, on the right left hand side, I've compared a ready to use product in a trigger bottle against the same product as a concentrate in a smaller packaging then it hardly makes a difference. Why? Because of the first principle I explained before. It's better to use a concentrate product than a ready to use because you can clean so much more surface with a concentrate than with a ready to use. You use much less plastic. So the percentage of impact of using PCR on a concentrate is so much lower than using on a trigger bottle. So my message is, Yes, let's replace all the trigger bottles with PCR, plastic trigger bottles. That will be a good benefit. But even better is get rid of trigger bottles at all and use concentrated products for which you refill your trigger bottle. That's the best way to save the planet. So, trying to give you a number of examples, try to explain to you what carbon footprinting means, what LCA means, why you have to look out for. But then at the end, I'll give you some takeaways. 
Remember, what's the scope of your carbon footprint? If you want to do it, very good. But first, define what you want to measure. Secondly, don't forget global warming potential of your products is only one element of environmental impact. Ecotoxicology, safety, human health and safety, all these elements are part of it as well. It's not only carbon footprint. If you do carbon footprinting, do it by effective cleaning as the measure, as the unit, because that gives you relevant information, not on a case-by-case -case basis. Moving to natural or natural-based ingredients, perfect. But do remember, ask your supplier, where are these ingredients coming from? Because if they are coming from agri-food that is specially designed for you, it doesn't make sense. If it is based on waste, perfect. And the last one, use concentrates and use them to refill your trigger bottles. Don't use ready-to-use products, even if it is based on PCR plastics, because the benefit is small. Thank you. But uh, one last remark. This is all fine, but we all have a personal responsibility in the world as well. Eh? So I'll leave you with this question. What are you doing to save our planet? What are you doing yourself? Here are some numbers, here are some hints. What you can do, and you see the numbers behind that, what your personal contribution would be if you would want to do one of these actions. Thank you very much.